once I did that, I thought I thought it was pretty good. Well, I liked it. <laughs> Don't that's <laughs> stupid. <laughs> I liked it, so you will too. <laughs> hey, I'm William here at uh, Northern Brewer, and today we're back with another exciting Grainfather G40 video. Today we tried out a uh, kettle sour in it. It's one of my favorite styles. We all love sour beers. Uh, and kettle sours tend to take a little bit of time. You need to keep them, after the mash, you have to keep them warm, 85, 95 in that range for up to, it can take up to three days, generally less than a day though. Um, so we all thought that the G40 might be a good candidate to try that out in just because it's got that built-in temperature control. So you can just kind of set it and forget it was the, the theory behind it. If this is your first time seeing the Grainfather G40 all-in-one brew system on our YouTube channel, Please check out our other Grainfather G40 content. Uh, it includes a video of uh, unboxing it, and then also our very first brew day, uh, where also we learned a few other tricks about it. Both of those will be linked in the video description below. Otherwise, let's get into kettle souring a beer. So to really test it, we wanted to do a 10 gallon batch. Uh, we went with our Duck Duck Goza kit, and um, since we were already experimenting, we figured why not experiment a little bit more and do a split batch and do a couple new twists on that uh, kit. So we did a mango, chili goza. For that one we used our crystallized mango powder um, and then some assorted peppers out of my garden from earlier in the season. And then the other one is one that I like to call a uh, pop goza the weasel. We all love beer puns uh, and that one uses cryo pop hops which is hard to say <laughs> and then also lutra yeast which is actually named after lutra which is in the weasel family so hence pop goza the weasel. To be clear, this isn't going to be a video on kettle souring. This is a video on using the G40 to kettle sour. We have another video that does cover how to kettle sour from start to finish with all the ins and outs and an in-depth explanation. See that link in the video description. All right, for, for this, the first thing was entering the recipe into the app. I was hopeful that uh, I figured there'd be some hiccups along the way. Um, it doesn't have a built-in kettle sour setting. Uh, so you had to work with the app a little bit, but it, it went very smoothly. Um, there are two limitations that will come up on that, uh, limitations in the app that had to do some slight workarounds, but they were easy and not a big deal at all. So uh, first thing is entering in the app, standard like anything else you enter into there. You start off with the ingredients, do that per normal. Then when it gets to the mash step, that's where it gets a little bit trickier with it. Again, because they don't have that built-in kettle sour uh, intelligence, I guess, or, uh, or step. You enter it in, you do your first mash step. And then for mash out, I did what I call a mash out slash sh short boil. And I named that in the recipe so that when the app shows my next step, it reminds me what I'm doing since it's kind of an awkward uh, process. So once you get that first mash step entered, the next one is going to be that short boil mash out that I call. Um, that one is where the first limitation came up in the software. The max temperature you can put in for a mash step is 203, which I don't know why you can go to 203 and why that's their cutoff. <laughs> um, but so that was the cutoff there, so which was fine because I know that you can override that temperature on the control panel on the G40 once it gets to that setting. One of the other limitations that I found um, has to do with the sparge reminder. The app tells you to get your sparge water heating roughly a half hour before it's time to boil. Since I was working around the app and I was actually doing that short boil for the kettle sour, I needed my sparge water ready before the app would tell me. Uh, so just remember that you'll need to set a reminder for that sparge water on your phone or any place else really or post-it note. Um, just because the one limitation really is that it just won't tell you that. Um, no big deal. I forgot, and then I forgot to heat my sparge water, so then I missed a step, and it went to the next step. But then I learned that you could actually go back a step in the F, which was actually really cool. I didn't know that. Um, so I was able to go back a step, pause it, get caught back up with the sparge water. Is, for me, fooling around with something is actually a really neat experience to learn that the system has your back in a sense, and it can help you fix some stuff like that. I think it was just about the time that I realized I didn't heat up my sparge water that uh, one of my 
brewery supervisors decided to pay a visit and let me know that I wasn't doing it quite right. Plus, she was really just mad because she likes to knock over my grain bucket after I'm done milling and eat all the grains if I'm turning my back. So <laughs> I think she was just there for a snack. Since I was already playing with a lot of stuff in the recipe, I decided to try sparging slightly different than what most people would probably recommend. Um, anytime I'm using electric, especially an all-in-one like these, I like to circulate the wort as it's heating up. I think it just gives you a better heat distribution. Um, so for the sparge, once I got all the sparge water collected, it was still, it's still dripping through the basket, but uh, since I have a nice brew in the bag pulley system, I use that to actually hoist that up out of the G40 and I was able to put in the recirculating arm then and start recirculating the mash. Not needed, just something I wanted to try and geek out on. So <laughs> just more fun on a brew day because that's ultimately what it's about. Once that's entered, I did a 10 minutes for the short boil, and that's just to, again, it's part of the kettle souring process. You just want to make sure that that wort is sterile and that when you go to add the lactobacillus to do the kettle souring, that it's only that lactobacillus in the kettle doing it and none of the bugs or bacteria that might have fallen in there or been in the grain or LME or whatever you're using. So it's an important step just to do that quick uh, sanitation of the wort. After that 10 minute boil, you're going to need to chill it down to the kettle souring temp. Um, unlike traditional brews, when you're cooling it down, you'd be cooling it down into your fermenter. You'd be going through the counter flow chiller into a fermenter. Uh, for this one, you're gonna go through that counter flow chiller back into that same kettle. Um, cool chill time can take longer just because you're putting that water back in there. Um, so just be aware that it might take longer than normal. If you had an immersion chiller, I might recommend doing that. It might be a little bit quicker in this situation. Once that hits 95, uh, I removed the chiller from it. I actually got the sparge arm back and I sanitized that, put that back in that so anytime that I wanted to, I could use that pump to rotate it and stir it and just keep it moving. Um, it's nice to have when you're heating it up for kettle sours, just keep that work moving, keep it nice even heat distribution. Uh, once that's down to lactobacillus pitching temperature, uh, again, 85 to 95, I think is the best range. Um, all the manufacturers have different ranges. I think if you can keep it closer to that 90, 95, that's gonna get you that really quick kettle souring. At this point, before pitching the lactobacillus, you could use lactic acid or phosphoric acid to help lower the pH below 4.5. Uh, that's just gonna help you get a cleaner ferment, a nicer, quicker, lactobacillus ferment. So once it's uh, pre-acidified, go ahead and add the lactobacillus. Um, I just gave it a light swirl just to kind of stir it up. Makes me feel good, not needed. Uh, the other thing you could do is then CO2 purge that headspace and put the lid on. Uh, I didn't worry about the CO2 purge. Uh, days that I'm being anal, I do do it. Um, the other thing is with that G40 lid, I put that on and I just put a little piece of electrical tape. There's a hole over it, so I just put a little piece of electrical tape over that to not let any heat go out through that or any unwanted bugs to fly in through there or whatnot. The next one is entering in the kettle sour duration. Uh, what I was most interested in is, can I set the G40 for multiple days? Um, wasn't sure if that was possible. It is. <laughs> you can, it uses minutes, so you have to convert hours to minutes, no big deal. Well, it started off with 20 hours, which is 1,200 minutes, I believe. <laughs> In my experience, 20 hours has been plenty, especially if you're doing the wort pre-acidification. Um, that just helps get a cleaner ferment, better head on their pores later on. Uh, I think it also gives the lactobacillus a little bit of a head start, just left less heavy lifting for them. And a starter always helps. I, want, I will point out I did not do a starter for this one with the lactobacillus because Omega came up with the new larger pitch sizes and I wanted to see how those would do without a starter and they were fantastic. So once that was all sealed up and nice, uh, I went back to you know letting it run for quite a few hours before I went to bed that night. I wanted to see how the control box was gonna handle doing the kettle sour, maintaining that lower temperature. Uh, just wanted to watch that, see how it was gonna behave. Over the course of time that I watched it, it it'd ramp up the temp. It, there's a little power meter on the control box and it zero to 100% and it can show you the, the percentage and it stayed zero to 
for the full time. So it'd cycle up sometimes if it needed to heat it up a little bit more or you'd just kill it if it was at 95 and let it go. That worked well for up till bedtime. <laughs> um, in my experience, larger batches like this tend not to drop temperature too much. So I chose not to let the control box run all night long. I didn't, I didn't want to, didn't want to learn any other new shortcomings <laughs> the hard way. So I did that, wrapped it with a sweatshirt to give it a little bit more uh, insulation and called it a night. I got up the next day. I don't remember how much it dropped, but it was still above 80. Um, at which point I turned it back on. It instantly started ramping up the temp. The nice thing is that I had that recirculating arm in there. So as soon as I saw that it needed to come up that much, I turned the pump on because it won't turn the pump on at that point. Uh, so I turned the pump on just to keep that swirl in. Uh, it's a trick I learned a while ago when I first started doing kettle sours with gas burners is you can kind of just juice it and stir it and get a little bit more heat in there. Um, doesn't, doesn't hurt the lacto at all. So worked worked that way and it worked well on the G40. Started checking the pH in the morning because it can go pretty quick. Um, it did take, I think 19 hours for this one to hit pH that was good enough for me. For a finished kettle sour pH, what I'm looking for during that uh, kettle souring phase is anywhere between three to 3.4. I have found that right in the middle 3.2 is kind of my preferred um, pH level, so I try to find it and hit it at that spot. This one went a little bit quicker and one a little bit lower than that, which is fine. Uh, once that pH hit, it was time to do the, do the boil. Uh, um, at that point, it's pretty much standard brew day, uh, like any other boil. You bring it up the boil, you add your first hops or any other ingredients. Um, so for Goza, pretty, pretty straightforward brew day at that point once it's boiling couple ounces of hops at the beginning of the boil and then some coriander towards the end and that's kind of it so pretty straightforward brew day. So once the boil is all complete I uh, hooked the chiller back up normal uh, transferred that into two of the fermenters and then I did a little bit more experimenting so we took our nice light uh, crisp fruity quite I find goes as quite refreshing actually a little bit of salt just brings you back wanting more. So we decided to take that and make a Fun little dry hop version because who doesn't like dry hopping stuff and then also um, a mango chili one i'm a big fan of spicy salty fruity candies so i thought this would be a great style to try i've tried it a few times in the past uh, they turn out pretty well first one that actually wrapped up fermentation a little bit quicker and um, just because i didn't have to dry pepper it <laughs> and keep monitoring it was the pop goes the weasel um i thought this one would be fun because of the New Lutra Quebec supposed to, it is very clean, um, works well in high temperatures, so why not use it in the winter time when my house is cold? <laughs> uh, super clean, just wanted to kind of let the salt and the fruitiness and the hops shine through. So uh, then I also used the new Cryo Pop Hops. Uh, it's a new hop blend in Cryo Pops that are supposed to give you just a ton of tropical fruit, passion fruit, just fruit bomb in your face all over the place. I've done other versions of dry hop gozas using cryo hops and they, they all turn out great. I really recommend trying to playing with it if you haven't done that. Um, it did showcase how clean Lutra can be actually. Um, I did notice that there was some fruit flavor missing in there that is actually yeast driven. And so that kind of threw me at first, but it was a fun experiment. Still a great drinking beer. And so for this one, the, the mango, Chili, um, this was the one I was most excited for just because the other one was kind of a known, <laughs> known outcome. This one I was pretty excited for just because uh, I'm going to try out one of our newer ingredients, some of the crystallized mango powder that we have. The crystallized powders are great for working with fruit. Super easy to use, no mess. And best part is that you can dose them at packaging, bottling, or kegging and do it to flavor, uh, which I would recommend. For peppers, I went with some Habanadas that I grew this past summer, those are just peppers that have habanero taste, but no flavor. So I just kind of cut those up. I removed the seeds just because I didn't want to deal with the seeds in the, in the beer later. I wasn't worried about heat because they're not hot. Um, put those in a small mason jar and just covered it with enough vodka just to make sure there were no bugs or anything on there. Made a little tincture in a sense with that. Uh, I'd recommend doing that overnight, but I'm impatient. So I only did it for a couple hours and dumped the whole thing in. 
it worked pretty well. It took longer than I expected for the pepper flavor to infuse. Um, I just didn't have that many peppers, I think is really the issue. <laughs> um, and then for heat, I decided to use one of my homegrown scorpion peppers. And as I dropped it in, I joked saying that I'll probably have to take this out tomorrow. <laughs> And the next day I tasted it and I had to take it out. Um, so I threw it in there loose, so I had to go find a pair of kitchen tongs and sterilize those and fish them out. <laughs> you can see that in uh, one of the photos. It worked, it was kind of fun too. I don't, you know, part of brewing. Sometimes you come to weird crossroads and just have to figure it out. So it worked well, uh, transferred that in. Oh, transferred both those over to keg and got them carbonated up. Um, it's nice to see that they're all the same color. Uh, there was no real differences between it. Um, they both have kind of that underlying Goza characteristic. Uh, the fruitiness in the mango chili one is really fruity. That, that crystallized powder a little goes a long way, especially in a lighter beer like this, I think. Um, and then you just kind of get a nice little chili heat at the back end. I actually had to up the salt level in this just a little bit. I don't know if it was the chili or the mango or a combination of both, but I just wasn't really getting that little bit of salt quality in the background that just kind of makes you want more. Um, so I had to up that. Gozas, I have probably brewed more Gozas than any other beer. Uh, quite, quite a lot. <laughs> uh, it was super fun to do it on a new piece of equipment, try some new things, try some new spins on it. It's a fun recipe to play with, especially with just additives like this. Um, it's great base beer for anything like that. I had a lot of fun trying out the G40. I don't think I probably would have learned that you can go back a step without, without trying to do some crazy stuff with the kettle sour. Um, it worked great. I definitely look forward to trying more kettle sours in the G40 for sure. For all things grandfather, including new accessories, new equipment, and the beer kit Duck Duck Goza, check out northernbrewer.com.